Our guest this week is David Stockman, who returns for the second part of an interview we began last week. Also last week, David spoke at our Mises Circle event in Stanford, Connecticut, along with Jim Grant and Judge Andrew Napolitano, and he really enjoyed a great reception there. Stockman was a congressman, he was Ronald Reagan's OMB budget director, and he was a private equity fund manager. He wrote a phenomenal book called The Great Deformation, which really exposes and chronicles crony capitalism like no other book written. And I think it's one of the most important books on capitalism written in the 20th century. His Contra Corner website is unbelievably prolific, and I really encourage you to read it daily. So if you're interested in how the economy works and how it really should work, uh, stay tuned for part two of a fascinating interview with David Stockton. I heard Rand Paul say something the other day that relates to this. He said it's very important to understand whether it was capitalism, in fact, that caused the crash of 08. And this is really what you're talking about. This is the question I think you answer in the Great Deformation. Right. I mean, I would say uh, in 08 and now again in 2015, you know, the world financial system, not just here uh, in the United States, but around the world, because all the central banks are doing the same thing, is rife with dangerous combustible speculation. But that's not due to the flaws of capitalism or the greed of human nature. It is a result of massive central bank intrusion in the money and capital markets and the destruction of price discovery uh, uh, everywhere. And if you don't have honest pricing in the money market, in the debt markets, in the equity markets based on supply and demand, and um, uh, you know a marketplace uh, that is not uh, dominated and manipulated by an external agency of the state, that is the central bank, uh, you're going to be uh, in big trouble. And uh, therefore, you leave markets uh, flying blind, uh, pricing everything based on what they think you know the 12 members of the Open Market Committee are going to do next. When in fact uh, the financial market should be pricing based on the views of millions of people, uh, traders and investors, and uh, you know borrowers and savers and and all the rest, uh, trying to decide uh, uh, and uh, discover the right price for things uh, hour by hour, day by day. Uh, that system would work uh, uh, wonderfully. Uh, it's proven historically. But it has been totally um, disabled, uh, set aside uh, by this uh, massive central bank intrusion. Every price today, from the federal funds rate to the 30-year bond to the S&P index uh, to uh, almost all the stocks uh, indirectly uh, in the market, the five or 8,000, uh, are uh, overwhelmingly being determined by uh, central bank policy uh, and central bank uh, intervention rather than um, the marketplace uh, force of supply and demand. Uh, we can go back to 2008, and uh, I think the story is about 2008 is uh, the uh, number of urban legends that have been built up uh, that justified uh, everything that the Fed did and the massive uh, uh, intervention in the form of TARP uh, you know, has become so much part of the mainstream narrative that uh, the Fed is allowed to continue to repeat the same mistake over and over. And what I tried to do in the Great Deformation was go back and look at each of the events, almost day by day, week by week, that uh, occurred from the time that they bailed out Fannie and Freddie, and then a few weeks later, the Lehman uh, bankruptcy came, and before we knew it, uh, TARP was on the floor of the House, voted down appropriately, uh, markets uh, uh, cratered, uh, they made them uh, you know, walk the plank again and pass it against their better judgment. When you go through all of that, you know, there was just flat out lies that were being told by a few people, Bernanke and Paulson, and they, they simply uh, created a herd panic in Washington that led to some uh, awful policy and precedent. There was no Great Depression 2.0 around the corner. That's just faulty nonsense that 
Bernanke conjured up in his own mind because he thinks he's a great scholar of the 1930s and almost everything he's ever written about the Great Depression in the 1930s I think is wrong and can be readily <laughs> refuted, and I did that uh, in my book as well. Um, uh, obviously, Paulson was hearing all kinds of panic cries from his buddies at Goldman Sachs and on Wall Street who had been gambling for years and now uh, didn't want to face the music. Neither of those were good reasons. Uh, AIG wasn't bankrupt at the insurance subsidiary level, only at the holding company where they were selling, uh, you know, the uh, the uh, uh, mortgage uh, product insurance. Uh, that easily could have uh, been taken to a bankruptcy court, and uh, no one's insurance uh, would have been impacted anywhere in the United States or elsewhere around the world. So I go through a lot of these uh, 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 events that occurred at, at the time of the so-called 208 financial crisis and demonstrate uh, that, you know, we weren't on the edge of Armageddon. We should have allowed uh, the marketplace to work its will. Uh, this wasn't a uh, threat to the Main Street banking system in America. There was not going to be lines at the teller windows all over the United States. This was a crisis in the canyons of Wall Street due to the massive uh, mismatch on balance sheets and leverage that had been created uh, over the previous five or six years. It should have been allowed to uh, uh, finish, uh, you know, the unwind should have been allowed to finish. Uh, and my argument is that the whole uh, meltdown would have uh, burned out in the canyons of Wall Street, uh, there would have been uh, uh, no uh, investment banks left. Goldman would have gone under. Morgan Stanley was uh, clearly insolvent, uh, save for huge uh, you know, bailout lines from the Fed in Washington. But the world would be a lot better today if both of those firms had been liquidated and forced to start over. Uh, but none of that happened, and so uh, we have simply doubled down uh, at the central bank with even more fantastic uh, expansion of balance sheets and uh, intrusion into the financial system. And uh, we're, you know, on the lip, I think, of the next uh, great um, uh, crisis, financial crisis. It's interesting in your book, The Great Deformation, it's actually on page 544, folks. You list the four reasons why the what you consider a, an ersatz panic of Wall Street would not have made its way to Main Street. And I think that page is one of the most important pages written in any book in the 21st okay. century. But, uh, um, you know, going back to your years in private equity, obviously, you know, the M&A world. Uh, can you talk a bit about how the merger and stock buyback mania doesn't produce any real value for shareholders or for the economy? Yeah, I mean, there is nothing wrong in a healthy capitalist system, uh, per se, with uh, either stock buybacks or mergers. But if you have a heavily distorted uh, system in which debt is massively underpriced and therefore way too cheap, uh, if you have a stock market which uh, more or less the Fed is committed to propping up and supporting, uh, you create incentives for um, uh, you know corporate decisions and corporate behaviors uh, that are highly uh, um, uh, inefficient or uh, uh, unproductive. And so, therefore, uh, as I've uh, tried to demonstrate in some of my blogs, but also so to some degree in the book, there is a massive excess of M&A deals that are not driven by business logic or real synergies or, uh, you know, uh, productive uh, considerations, but uh, happen because uh, the financing is so cheap. Overwhelmingly, uh, these deals are, are cash-based. And uh, they're funded through massive uh, junk bond or even investment grade bond issues. You can look at some of the uh, uh, you know corporate issues of the last four or five years and see thirty, forty, fifty billion dollar issues, not to fund one additional piece of equipment or plant or uh, rolling stock or anything else, but to uh, simply uh, finance uh, a uh, merger deal. 
So um, I think what we have is uh, a system that is now so distorted that overwhelmingly uh, the cash that's being generated by corporate America plus the massive increase in borrowing that has happened is slowing into financial engineering deals. uh, And ultimately, that cash makes its way back to the stock market, to the gambling arena, uh, where it drives up prices, uh, further intensifies the mania, and, uh, you know, compounds uh, the whole dynamic underway. Uh, If you look at real investment uh, in plant and equipment uh, over the last decade, it's uh, less than 1% per year in real terms. If you look at even since uh, the 207 peak, uh, the recovery has been very tepid, and uh, plant and equipment in real terms uh, today is, uh, after uh, allowance for the depreciation that we're using up every year, is actually lower than it was in 1999. So, therefore, you can understand... um, The anomaly that we have uh, today, which is massive corporate debt and borrowing, you see evidence of it every day, and uh, virtually non-existent real investment in plant and equipment and productive assets uh, going forward on a sustained uh, 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 basis. And the reason for that disconnect, the reason for that anomaly is The distortions in the financial system are causing a massive flow of cash and borrowings, uh, as I say, into financial engineering, ultimately into the casino uh, where it gets recycled over and over and therefore uh, creates, you know, even more, uh, you know, dangerous instability and uh, speculative mania that uh, we we can see all around us. But isn't this sad in a sense? In other words, in a non-crony economy, wouldn't private equity and venture capital play a noble role in allocating resources? Yeah, I, I think they would. And uh, that's the real sad thing is to use your word, and I think it's a good one. Uh, these powerful mechanisms of the market and of uh, uh, capitalism are being perverted and you and turned against the system instead of being a, a source of funding for growth and innovation and invention, uh, they have become the instruments uh, basically of unproductive uh, and unstable uh, financial uh, speculation. That is uh, obviously not something that 90% of the population can engage in because they don't have the chips to bring to the table in the first place. And so, therefore, in this kind of speculative economy, only a very small fraction of the population can play, and uh, the windfalls uh, from the false pricing and uh, the you know inflation of financial assets that are systematically you know, driven uh, by the central bank accrues to the benefit of a very thin slice of the population. They say the 1%. Actually, it's probably one-tenth of 1% uh, that have the big asset positions in the hedge funds or the private equity world um, uh, that are, uh, you know, being showered with these uh, enormous uh, ill-gotten gains, and they're ill-gotten not because uh, of some traditional antipathy to capitalism. They're ill-gotten because they are the fruit of central bank uh, distortion of the financial system. Ladies and gentlemen, we're almost out of time, so I'd like to wrap this up, David, with a final question about your background. Now, I noticed that you went to Michigan State, a public school, for your bachelor's degree, so you didn't come out of the Harvard, Wharton, Stanford, uh, MBA finance world, and that later you attended Harvard Divinity School. So people may not know this, and I'd love to hear about how your education sort of shaped your viewpoint in your career. Well, you know, I came out of a very conservative uh, farm uh, background. I went to Michigan State because I wanted to be a farmer. The next thing I knew, the Vietnam War started. Uh, I knew that when I finished undergraduate, I was going to be drafted. I began to read a little bit. I started to go to some uh, uh, teach-ins and 
protests, I be, I quickly understood that this was a totally misbegotten uh, adventure by Washington, that uh, there was no threat to the security of America coming uh, from the Viet Cong uh, or uh, anyone else in Southeast Asia. I became very anti-war. I became a radical. I, uh, you know, went to Washington at all the demonstrations in New York, and I understood the dangers of big government at a very early age from the warfare state side. Then I graduated. I got my draft notice. I was not about uh, to join McNamara's army. I had an opportunity to uh, enroll in Harvard Divinity St School. I got a, a deferment as a result of that. And I spent the next two years bidding my time trying to learn a lot about history, trying to learn a lot about philosophy, even a little economics. I finally got to the point where the draft uh, was ended. I got a high uh, uh, number in the lottery and decided to go to Washington. And I began a career uh, uh, that you know, took me through uh, becoming a member of Congress in the 70s and then the Reagan budget office in the 80s and then Wall Street uh, beyond that. But uh, all the way through, uh, there was a common theme, which was a great skepticism about uh, uh, big government and uh, the aggrandizement of the state. And I started on the warfare state side. I got to Washington and worked for a congressman who uh, was uh, middle of the road on many social issues, but on economics, he was very free market oriented. And I began to develop a view on the dangers of the welfare state. And so by the time I became a member of Congress and then entered the uh, Reagan White House, I had a pretty good view of a uh, balanced view of the danger of big government. Now, the problem with the Reagan era was that uh, Reagan was actually very pro-big government on the Pentagon side of the Potomac and anti-big government on uh, the domestic side. The problem is that didn't work. He couldn't put a coalition together on Capitol Hill uh, based on that kind of uh, disconnect, and it's the real reason why uh, very little progress was made. If had we not had the Reagan uh, White House not been taken over by the neocons, had he not been, been himself, Ronald Reagan, bamboozled by uh, the uh, kind of uh, you know extremist view that the Soviet Union was developing a first strike capability and all the rest. None of that was true. The Soviet Union in 1981 was on its last legs because socialism doesn't work. Marxism uh, is a false philosophy. The system was uh, collapsing on its own weight. We had plenty of uh, deterrent force in our Minuteman missile uh, force and the uh, Trident uh, Polaris uh, submarines to deter what was whatever was left of the Soviet Union in its, its waning years. We did not need this massive buildup. We did not need a uh, big government on the Pentagon side. It was a giant historical mistake. Reagan fell for it. And it's in the result of that, we had huge deficits and uh, a uh, kind of, you know, discombobulated uh, uh, policy and uh, political coalition that um, ultimately failed uh, to bring big government to heel. What it did do was create mythology, uh, the mythology that uh, the Reagan era was a roaring success, that deficits don't matter, and that all you have to do is keep cutting taxes and everything will be uh, better. Uh, that was a uh, enormously uh, unfortunate and uh, counterproductive or wrong lesson uh, from the Reagan era. And so for the next 30 years, we had two free lunch parties, the Democrats defending all the spending, the Republicans constantly wanting to cut taxes. We now have $18 trillion of debt. The day I went into OMB, we had $1 trillion. So, you, you know, 18x uh, in a period that I can remember quite well, uh, in a period when the economy may be uh, up by four times uh, on a nominal basis. So what I'm saying is uh, that uh, that was a historic juncture. It was a time of enormous opportunity to roll back the status policies of, of 50 years 
and uh, unfortunately it didn't happen because of the giant mistake that was made when the Republican Party allowed itself to be taken hostage by the neocons and imperialists and warmongers, as I call them, that have ruled the Republican Party ever since. Dave Stockman, thank you so much for your time today. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend.